Hi there. I'm Horser, one of the most accomplished Nemesis players in all of Dead by Daylight, currently rank 4 in the whole wide world for whipdowns, and this is my guide to my favorite killer, the Nemesis. This guide is going to be in-depth, covering power, terminologies, the numbers, maps, and a couple of other things. Let's get things started. Why play the Nemesis? You have permanent AI companions, or friends, that act as passive slowdown by harassing survivors. Mine are called Craig and Julia, but you can call yours whatever you would like. Zombies can zone survivors from powerful loops. Zombies offer a good amount of passive slowdown when they do their job. Nemesis is THE pallet destroying machine, especially on maps that have an excess of strong pallets. For example, Saw's The Game. As well as having the ability to destroy pallets while they're being dropped, being vaulted, etc. Nemesis has a decent skill ceiling via the macro heavy play of finding out information on survivors via your zombies and the micro play on how to use your whip. There is a lot to master and a lot to play around with. As the absolute tallest killer in the game, Nemesis has no trouble reading mind games over most loops. Coming from one of the most popular horror game franchises of all time, Nemesis's colossal stature makes you feel like a hulking monstrosity. You get stronger as the game goes on, and what little means survivors have to escape you means less and less as their resources dwindle. It is a near-unanimous opinion that Nemesis has one of the best, if not the best, chase music in the game. Power is incredibly satisfying to use, whether it be getting a hit at maximum range or shredding through every single pallet like a hot knife through butter. The animations for breaking pallets, walls, and generators are good. Nemesis has good passive information gathering via zombies, killer instinct from vaccines, and hearing survivors cough when afflicted by the T-virus. <coughs> Contamination allows survivors to be heard even when healthy, and the sound of these coughs cannot be quiet in the crouch. <coughs> Nemesis is the only killer in the game who straight up punches people. Bitch can't even swim. These are not deal breakers, just things that you should be aware of. Add-ons are nothing to write home about. None are game-changing, even the iridescent rarity ones are okay at best. Zombies can absolutely block survivors for you. Unfortunately, they can also block you. Let's go gambling! Zombies are 100% RNG, and you'll have just as many games where they do absolutely nothing as those where you are carried to victory by their existence. Nemesis is adjacent to setup killers like Hag, Trapper, Singularity, etc. as it takes some time to get the ball rolling, so to speak. At the absolute best of times, assuming you use your power, Nemesis is a 3 health state killer. Nemesis's passive is the T-Virus, and it allows him to grow stronger as the game goes on, and he uses his power, Tentacle Strike, referred to primarily as the Whip. Hitting survivors and zombies with the whip will grant Nemesis contamination points, which work towards raising his power to the next mutation rate, usually referred to as tears, until maxing out at the third. Upon being hit by a zombie or a whip for the first time, a survivor becomes contaminated, indicated by a change on the HUD, and the affected survivor's model will become coded in blue. Contamination can be removed by opening one of four supply cases around the trial. Inside these cases are single-use vaccines, which remove contamination and offer the nemesis killer instinct for three seconds. Both cases and the aura of a vaccine, should it be dropped on the ground, will have their aura shown in white to contaminated survivors. Opening a case takes four seconds to open base kit, and a case will close itself after 15 seconds if the vaccine is not taken out of it, causing a survivor to have to open the case again. Vaccinating causes three seconds of killer instinct to be shown to the nemesis. You may vaccinate contaminated allies, but the survivor who gives the vaccine will be the one that receives any vaccination-related debuffs, such as the aforementioned killer instinct, the increased killer instinct from adrenaline injector, or the exposed status that comes with the iridescent umbrella badge. Mutation rate 1, or tier 1, has no special benefits. Nemesis' attack, the Tentacle Strike, is unable to break breakable walls and pallets, has a range of 5 meters, and reduces his move speed to 3.8 meters per second, 
which is 95% of base survivor move speed. Mutation rate 1 can be frustrating, as survivors can pre-drop pallets from a distance with little to zero repercussions, but as the game progresses further and you tear up, Nemesis gets much stronger. And this is worth mentioning, as the early game weakness can be a turnoff for newer players, because there isn't an instant gratification to his power. Multiple early contaminations and the vaccination economy being lowered for survivors, however, does set you up for later. Mutation Rate 2, or Tier 2, has the added benefit of allowing the Tentacle Strike to break breakable walls and pallets. This tier is what sets Nemesis apart from the rest of the cast of killers as the number one destroyer of pallets. Mutation Rate 3, or Tier 3, extends the range of Tentacle Strike from 5 meters to 6. On top of this, it changes the movement speed of the Nemesis while holding the Tentacle out from 3.8 meters a second to 4 meters a second, or the exact same speed as a base speed survivor. Now the increase may sound small, but it's the difference between getting a hit and not a substantial amount of the time. Combined with the speed increase, it's a pretty hefty upgrade. A survivor struck by a tentacle strike will become contaminated, which gives Nemesis progress towards his mutation rate and grants Nemesis contamination points. Three points for survivors freshly contaminated, and one point for those already afflicted, and another one for killing a zombie with a whip. Tier 1 to Tier 2 takes 6 contamination points. Tier 2 to Tier 3 takes 9 contamination points. Zombies can also inflict contamination, but they do not grant any further points towards tearing up the mutation rate. And speaking of these zombies, you can see the aura of both of them in white the entire trial. These zombies will track nearby survivors, they can attack survivors that get too close, and zombies move at 1 meter per second base kit of course possible to increase this speed with add-ons. They have a 14 meter visual detection range, a 6 meter audio detection range, and they stop chasing a survivor when they are 20 meters away or more. Zombies will spawn below random hooks 12 seconds into the game. You can body block zombies to keep them in a good area. Camping a hook for you in endgame, it's extremely helpful to deny altruism. It can force a no-win scenario. This is your one and only time. No, no, no. Stay. What a Craigster. There are plenty of add ons to buff a zombie's field of view, its move speed, etc. You can buff the playstyle if you enjoy that. The add-ons for the zombies are not bad. The band add-ons also increase the visual detection range for zombies, uh, not the sound, but that is a very unique interaction. They were the only two add-ons that do that. And speaking of the sound detection, there is actually a perk, Surveillance, that will increase the distance that zombies can hear from. And they react to noises caused by survivors, including but not limited to rushed actions, repairing generators, unlocking chests, etc but all of those have a shorter range than a loud noise notification by fast vaulting or throwing a pallet. If a zombie falls for more than half of a meter, this means off a hill, down a hole, etc., they will be stuck in place for about three and a half seconds before they start walking again. Zombies may be killed by survivors using pallet or head-on, and this changes the affected zombie's respawn time to 45 seconds, instead of the usual 15 if they are killed by the nemesis. Zombies can be blinded and stunned in place by survivors for another 15 seconds by flashbangs, firecrackers, and flashlights, and this blinding of a zombie shrinks its hitbox and allows a survivor to pass by unimpeded. Speaking of blinds, when holding out his whip, the nemesis can only move his camera up 20 degrees or down 32 degrees, which means you are incredibly vulnerable to blinds from flashlights if a survivor knows how to take advantage of this, as you are physically unable to look away via the usual up and down strategy. Bots will really take advantage of this. You'll notice this a lot if you're trying to use your power against a bot with a flashlight. They will go for it. They will hit it, even mid-chase. The Zom Drop. This is basically a bootleg agitation without the need to use a perk slot. There are a few setups that you need to do this. It's not something you can do all the time as it very much requires positioning. It requires the survivor to be contaminated. It can be countered, but it requires an altruist with really good timing. They have to force the zombie swing prior to the drop requires a lot of coordination, and it's happened to me like 
two or three times ever. So this is a pretty reliable technique. I have never had a nemesis do this to me. I don't think I've discovered it. I'm sure someone else started doing this first, but it's really helpful. So what's the zom drop? Basically, it's when you have a survivor in a corner where you can't get to a hook. They have boil over. They have flip-flop something. Some reason you can't get to a hook. You want to get to a scourge hook, but it's too far away. Basically, when a survivor is about to wiggle off your shoulder, you will simply have a zombie to your left, and they will wiggle off into the zombie, instantaneously get downed again, and then you can pick them up and then continue on to your hook that is slightly further away. This is really helpful for getting to a scourge that's too far away, this hooking someone away from a door in the end game, getting out of a comp corner, avoiding sabo plays, etc. It is a really diverse strategy, it helps me a lot. I can't say I get it every game, but when I do, it is always extremely helpful. Nemesis is a short to medium range ranged killer. The whip has a range of 5 to 6 meters based on tier. It is similar to Xenomorph's tail, but with a completely different control scheme, as it's more of an axe chop compared to Xenomorph's throwing a rock attached to a string, and it is 1 to 2 meters longer than Xenomorph's 4 meter tail. The whip has a much tighter control than any other range killers, as most are fire and forget. Huntress, throw a hatchet. Trickster, throw a knife. Xenomorph has the closest level of control after you let go of your power, but Nemesis has the absolute most malleability with it, with how much it can be moved. And unlike Xenomorph, the whip can continue to strafe upon hitting collision, which is one of Nemesis' strongest parts of his kit. Nemesis will hit an obstacle with his whip, and it will keep going if you move it, and Xenomorphs will just stop. The whip hits over most objects in the game. It cannot go through solid walls like Pyramid Head. There are actually a few loops I can think of that they hit under, instead but these are very few and far between we will go over those more so specifically when they come up on their specific maps i can think of three right now and the most common one that you might be doing at least every game would be if you hit under the tall side of a dropped pallet that would be hitting under an obstacle and the nemesis whip has no travel time just wind up hits are instantaneous the whip drag this is truly the pinnacle of nemesis you can hit around corners, you can guarantee hits in tight corridors, such as on the game or RPD. You get accused of lag or cheating. It is, in my opinion, That's my opinion! one of the most fun parts of Nemesis to master, because you get so many hits that just feel so unfair. And it's, it's great. It's great. You'll love it. So, how do you do it, of course? Well, that's what I'm here to teach you. So, you pull out your tentacle with your M2. You throw your tentacle with your M1, and while the tentacle is being thrown, you move Nemesis to the right or left, depending on which way you'd like to drag the hitbox. For example, if you're along the side of Shack and you'd like to confirm a hit on the survivor running while tightly hugging the Shack, you start your whip on the outside of the survivor and press yourself towards the wall. They'll be struck by the lingering hitbox as if they tried to walk through it. This has a lot of applications in Dead by Daylight, such as the aforementioned hits around corners, out in the open, tight corridors, etc. And one of my favorite flashier versions of this is dragging the whip hitbox down like a guillotine while you're falling. Because it's just, it's just cool. It's fun to hit. Now there are a lot of perks, so I'm going to be going on these pretty quickly. We'll talk about what perks are good to use later, but if it's green, you can use it and know, like, this will help my kid out. This is a good recommendation. My zombies will like this. Discordance, it works. Eruption, it works. Hangman's trick. It does cause a loud noise notification, but it is semi-redundant in the fact that saboing a hook would already be causing a loud noise notification. I suppose you could see it as Hangman's trick will attract a zombie slightly earlier. I'm talking less than half a second. It is not great. But it will start the loud noise notification quicker because it makes the notification happen on start of the sabo instead of the end of the sabo. Hoarder. It does work with chests. 
not vaccine cases. This is an important distinction to make because if a survivor is looting a chest, Horda will work with that. But if they are looting a vaccine case, you will not just get a free zombie going over there to harass them. So normal chest, yes. And vaccine cases, ones built into your kit, the ones that come with you, doesn't work with order. No way out, great perk. Loud noise, they get notified, zombies go over there, they harass them. Spies from the Shadows, I do like this as a perk. Unfortunately, the loud noise notification just doesn't attract zombies. They don't care about birds, they want brains, birds are too feathery for them. Tinker, loud noise, zombies will go towards it. Face the Darkness is a fantastic hex to run if you want a zombie attraction build. It makes it so when you punch a survivor and all the other survivors scream, zombies will go straight towards them. This pairs really well with stealth builds or serotonin injector, anything that gets rid of your terror radius, so you can just permanently get screams going. Very nice. Call of Brine, the loud noise notification that happens when survivors hit a good skill check, it will attract zombies. Deathbound. The scream and trigger of loud noise notification does not attract zombies. I think this perk might be bugged, but again, not the golden child, so might get fixed in a year or two. Dragon's Grip. Scream attracts zombies very good. It will also attract you, because you're going back anyway. Friends till the end. When the obsession is hooked and a new survivor is selected as the obsession, that scream will attract zombies. The exposed effect in the aura reveal will not attract zombies. So if you are hooking the obsession, yes. If you are not hooking the obsession, then no. Infectious Fright. Screams attract zombies. Iron Maiden. Screams attract zombies. Make your choice. Again, this is another redundant perk because the unhook notification noise will attract the zombies regardless, so I'm not sure if the scream from make your choice matters at all for it. Regardless, they will be going back to hook, but again, it's not the perk, it's just the design. Scourge Pain Resonance. The scream will attract zombies. You can actually use this as information to see a zombie heading towards a generator in the distance. Surge is again another... I don't want to call it a redundant perk because it does just attract zombies because the perk itself is bugged. It has been for over a year now. When you down someone by punching them, it will cause gens being worked on by survivors within range to scream, and that scream will attract zombies, but the perk surge isn't supposed to cause screams, so this is kind of another iffy one, but it does work for now. Surveillance attracts zombies. However, it has no noise notification. There is no scream. It is unique in the way that it attracts zombies by buffing their hearing range. Surveillance will make it so you can hear a gen being worked on from an additional 8 meters away, which is very convenient because your zombies, or basically little coded mini versions of you, also get this extra 8 meters. So on top of their 6 meters of hearing, they get another 8 meters of hearing, which is a total of 14, which is a more than double distance effect. So it's very nice, and zombies can get a lot more value out of it. You notice it a lot, actually, and it's a very nice perk. Good synergy. Thwack. The screams attract zombies. Now, to survivor perks. Diversion, the pebble, it will attract zombies. Deception, the locker, it will attract zombies. Red herring, it will attract zombies. Scene partner, the scream will attract zombies. Sabotage, the loud noise notification, upon saboing the hook will attract the zombies. Flashbang, the explosion will attract them, same with firecrackers, but uniquely the perk Dramaturgy's scream does not attract zombies. Not sure if it's a bug, again. Okay, add-ons, what's good? What does what? Are there good builds? Absolutely. There are some that are better than others. Most are viable, but a lot of them are redundant just because there is a better version of it. And there's a lot of different build variety that you can do. You're not locked into running Marvin's Blood every game just because it is, by the numbers, the best add-on. There's a lot of play styles for Nemesis is what I'm trying to say. Brian's Intestine is the worst zombie movement speed add-on he has. There's no reason to ever run this. There's just better add-ons for both sides, even as a combo piece. You could run Recovery Coin and Eyeball. The Intestine, no reason to run it.
Damage Syringe was another add-on that I'd previously not given much of my time as I did the math and I was like, oh, it's at most 20 seconds of slowdown, that's not great. But after I was bringing up my tier list with Ots, I was talking about my personal add-on tier list, discussing this in Plant 43 Vines. He introduced to me the idea that Syringe and Vines were like the sloppy butcher versions of taking vaccines and opening cases. The syringe is higher than vines because you are way more likely to catch someone off guard vaccinating than you would be them opening a case. The Stars Feel the Combat Manual is the meme add-on. The only reason I can think of running this is if you were tracking stats for which zombie is better and wanted to know which zombie got a hit. It offers zero in-game benefits. It just turns your zombie yellow. That is that is it. That is the whole thing. The visitor wristband is a smaller version of the admin wristband. There's near zero reason to ever run visitor wristband by itself because the admin wristband is just a better version, but they do, however, stack, which is when visitor wristband would be getting value. Now the detection rate add-ons, the admin wristband, and the visitor wristband, they do the same thing, but one is better, they can stack, it increases the FOV of the zombies, and it increases their detection range. The admin wristband was something that I had much lower for quite some time before I saw this specific diagram made by Ostarva and running it for a few games. You can definitely feel the zombies being a lot slower than if you ran speed add-ons, but that's not the reason these are run. They increase the distance that survivors have to go away from zombies to stop being chased by 4 and 2 meters, as well as make them more likely to detect a survivor outside of their normal FOV. It's just a nice little add-on. It'll make it so survivors can't sneak past a zombie as easily. Adrenaline injector's only purpose is to extend killer instinct when survivors vaccinate. It is a completely unique add-on. There is no other add-on that does this for Nemesis. It combos well with the Iridescent Umbrella Badge if you're trying to force value from that, but by itself, the effect only gives you a total of 12 more seconds of information the entire trial at the absolute most. That's assuming all the vaccinations go off. You could make a case for this add-on being better than it is placed on this list just because Killer Instinct is not counterable, you cannot Calm Spirit it, you cannot Distortion it, there's nothing that affects Killer Instinct in-game right now, but it's very situational. In the best of the best here, Marvin's Blood is the best add-on the Nemesis has. It is just your base kit, but improved. You tear up quicker, and it rewards you for using your power how you should be normally. It used to be even better than this, but even after the nerf, it is still the best, which kind of speaks to Nemesis's other add-ons. Mahale's Eye is a nice little zombie speed add-on. It's cheap, it's yellow rarity, decent effect. Ink Ribbon is just better. But when you're just starting out, or you don't want to put too much money into Nemesis, this is a great add-on. Eyeball's great. Can't hurt. Zombie Heart is simply a worse version of Tyrant Gore or t Rider sample. There is pretty much zero reason to ever run this. You could just run Tyrant Gore and t Rider sample. Zombie Heart, waste of a slot. Now, in the actively detrimental category, there is one add-on, and it is the Liquor Tongue. I am not exaggerating when I say that this is the worst add-on in the game, not counting meme add-ons that just you play for blood points, of course, like a speed limiter or something. Liquor Tongue is a green add-on that offers you a grand total of, assuming you play the entire game perfectly, 1.6 seconds of slowdown, assuming you get 8 full contaminations, and Indigo Ninja, a friend of mine, did a fantastic comparison video 
of with this add-on versus without this add-on, and it is bad. I would genuinely prefer having an empty add-on slot as opposed to this thing. Don't run Liquor Tongue. Plant 43 vines are the sloppy butcher version of preventing survivors from opening cases. In a vacuum, 16 seconds of slowdown, but in my experience, events where I actually interrupted a survivor opening a case are few and far between. So you could, in theory, get more value if you cancel the survivor opening a case, but probably won't happen that often. In the good tier, you have Serotonin Injector. This is my personal favorite add-on for Nemesis. It fits into my personal playstyle of hitting zombies to tear up very well, especially when coupled with T-Virus Sample. You shave off an incredible amount of time in the average game by sneaking around, as the majority of players will preemptively run based on Terror Radius. By the time you're close enough for them to hear your boot stomping, they've lost plenty of time that they would have gotten normally if they ran from the Terror Radius. T-Virus Sample is the second add-on that I run the most, comboed with Serotonin Injector, as the two complement each other quite nicely. It flat out doubles the amount of mutation rate you get from hitting a zombie from 1 to 2 points, which if you remember from earlier, you need 6 points from Tier 1 to Tier 2, and 9 points from Tier 2 to Tier 3. It makes an incredible difference to the macro game of Nemesis, and it allows you to get your pallet breaking ability regardless of survivors pre-dropping you before you were in range to tier up. Tyrant Gore is better than I give it credit for. I just personally don't like it as much as I could because Marvin's Blood and Tyrant Gore both get you within 5 to 1% of a tier up. It's just a personal annoyance. It's not, meaning it's worse than it is. The zombie spawn reduction is really nice, and you could combo this with T Virus Sample for incredibly quick tearing up through whipping zombies. The Broken Recovery Coin raises your lethality, albeit not by a lot, by removing one case from the trial. And it saves you from having to recontaminate a survivor in the situation where all vaccines are being used. It's noticeable, just not by a lot. It only removes one case. It just feels like a waste of an add-on slot. Now, in the Decent tier, we have Depleted Ink Ribbon. It is a nice add-on to run, as the zombie move speed is the highest in its class of half a meter a second, and it does not have an activation condition like the Shattered Stars badge does. The reduced respawn time is nice too, however, the third condition is actively a detriment to you. When you put an idle zombie in the gate, you only get one per gate, and I legitimately have never gotten a hit doing this. A survivor would have to actively be not looking where they're going, not hear the zombie growling in the gate, and they would have to run straight into the idle zombie that does not even start to move until three seconds after the gate is open. Even when they swing, they usually miss. It's like you put a pillar with a spike on it, and you have to hope survivors run into it. It's not very helpful. The rest of the add-on, however, is very nice. Oh, fucking what? <laughs> Jill's sandwich is, on average, 48 seconds of aura reading. That's pretty good. In theory, you could get more value out of it if a survivor opens a case, then leaves it to close, but those are incredibly few and far between. My main gripe with the add-on is that unless you happen to be looking in the correct direction when a survivor opens a case, you may not even notice Jill Sandwich's effect going off, so it's okay.
The any alpha parasite is helpful for hit and run play styles, such as during early game when Nemesis is going for contaminating and injuring survivors instead of downing them. This pairs incredibly well with the perk corrupt intervention, which a lot of players use anyway, so they can tear up quickly and kind of get rid of their early game. It's a pretty long time, and it's a much more situational version of Serotonin Injector, because you can't get it all game. You lose the Oblivious Status effect when a survivor vaccinates, and it's pretty helpful when you go contaminate Survivor A, go do something else, maybe chase Survivor B, then come back to Survivor A, who you catch off guard, because they're still oblivious. Again, they wouldn't be oblivious anymore if they vaccinated, but it could be very helpful in the early game. Again, something to try might be your playstyle. The Iridescent Umbrella Badge is an add-on that you would expect to be higher seeing as how long 60 seconds is, and it being 60 seconds is the only reason it is this high, but that's not the reason why. Unless combined with Adrenaline Injector, the average survivor will not be vaccinating in your face, and unless you get lucky and find the person who is actively stealthing after being exposed, you won't really get value out of it. I'd say the only value out of this perk is actively preventing a survivor from going for a save or something because they're exposed for 60 seconds. Unless you head straight towards their killer instinct icon if you're not in a chase, there's just so many variables that have to ha go just right for Iridescent Umbrella Badge to get value. And if a survivor is vaccinating right next to you, they usually have other problems going on, such as the nemesis's neck snapping to look directly at them. So, it's okay. The Shattered Stars badge is an add-on that I had been sleeping on for quite some time, just due to the fact that I don't really enjoy running zombie add-ons as much, because I prefer my whip to raise my own lethality, as opposed to my AI-driven companions, but when practicing in scrims against my community for a charity tournament, I had gotten a lot of good feedback regarding this, and how it made zombies significantly harder to deal with, as a zombie could actively prevent a reset from happening for a full minute of time. I don't run it often, as I prefer my double greens, but its value is incredible, and the only downside is that it's limited in usage as it procs on gen completion. So, at most, you get... 300 seconds of zombie speed a game. And that is not taking into consideration the fact that gens could pop within 60 seconds of each other. And it does not add to the time, it simply resets the timer to 60 seconds. Frequently asked questions. How do I know if I can whip over something? So the general rule of thumb for this is that if you can see above a survivor's shoulders, you can hit them with a whip. This works for 90% of the obstacles in the game, thankfully, but there are plenty that you can't hit over due to the hitbox not matching the visual, and I will be covering that in upcoming map-specific videos. When is it better to hit over a pallet instead of just destroying it? This question is nuanced as it depends on the pallet, but again, a general rule of thumb is that if a survivor is injured and contaminated, there are usually zero repercussions to hitting them over the pallet. They can dead hard it, of course, but that's infrequent. And if the pallet is safe for a survivor, you should always aim to destroy the pallet, unless, you know, you can down them over it. Hitting a survivor over a safe pallet is one of the worst things you can do as Nemesis, because if you hit them over it, and they don't go down, they get enough distance to break chase with you, which is not ideal. When should I rely on my zombies and... When shouldn't I rely on them? Zombies are never guaranteed hits unless a survivor is funneled directly into a tight space with one, such as an RPD office or a doorway. You should think of them more as helpers that can sometimes assist you with pressure, but unless you are, again, actively forcing a survivor into a zombie, the most they provide is a threat, nothing more. The Shattered Stars badge will change that, of course, but most games you will not be getting injuries or contaminations from zombies unless a survivor makes a pretty big mistake.
when should you kill zombies? If a zombie is in a corner and you also happen to be there, if you're close to a tier up, if you're running zombie disintegration add-ons such as serotonin injector, t-virus sample, tyrant gore, the only real reason to leave a zombie in a dead zone is if it's either across the entire map and you would waste too much time going to get them, or if there is a hook in the dead zone with a survivor there because then it prevents the unhook heal from happening when they hear the loud noise notification. How do you tear up as soon as possible? Well, fresh contaminations are the number one way to tear up as Nemesis. If you get all four survivors contaminated, you already have 12 of your 15 points that you need. And if one vaccinates and you contaminate them again, you're already at tier three, incredibly early. Uh, most games, all four survivors do not spawn in a corner together or vaccinate that early, so the obvious advice is to just use your whip as often as possible. You can run add-ons for leveling up faster, like Marvin's Blood, T-Virus Sample for whipping zombies, or adopt a playstyle where you go for early contaminations and injuries with Corrupt Intervention, which is a relatively popular playstyle for more advanced Nemesis players. When should you M1? The main thing to know about Nemesis is that, and I know this is probably illegal to say, uh, M1-ing them or just striking them with your fist is not something that you can't do. It's more of an ego thing, of course. Like, hitting the whip just feels better most of the time. And I'm not gonna lie and say that on occasion I don't ego whip and miss like eight in a row before inevitably giving up and punching them, but don't be like me. If a survivor is too wiggly to hit with the whip, they keep running out in the open, they are generally in your head every time you try to whip drag, uh, unless you can force the whip drag in a hallway, get it out a window, something like that, uh, punching is fine. You'll tear up a bit slower, but while learning it's not illegal, just know that if you don't use your power, you're never going to get better with it, so making mistakes and learning from them is important as well. Dude, sucking at something is the first step towards being sort of good at something. Perk and add-on builds. So this first build is for zombies mainly, focusing on having zombies do the most of the work for you. The add-ons you want to choose, the options range of course, but as long as they buff zombies you'll be set. You can choose from the Shattered Stars badge, the Depleted Ink Ribbon, Mikhail's Eye, and the Admin Visitor Wristbands. If you plan on running Visitor Wristband, you should run both of them, otherwise just run Admin with a Speed add-on because Admin is just better. And for the perks for the zombie build, you should run something like Discordance, Surveillance, Hex Ruin, and Scourge Hook Pain Resonance. It's a nice little build for getting value out of your zombies. It uses perks that directly buff them. Discordance will attract zombies the entire game to generators being worked on by two or more survivors. And Surveillance slash Ruin combo well because it allows zombies to hear from much further away, more than double their usual range of 6 meters all the way up to 14 meters. And it makes zombies push survivors off a generator, it gives guaranteed ruin value, and it's just nice. It's a good combo. Pain Resonance is just good for the general slowdown. It can be substituted for a slowdown of your choosing. Of course, Pop Goes the Weasel is not recommended, as you cannot kick generators from regressing with Hex Ruin. If you don't feel like doing any active uh, slowdown, you could just bring Undying to make sure Ruin lasts as long as possible. The Sweaty or Competitive build the add-ons will be Marvin's Blood and Shattered Stars Badge or Serotonin Injector, depending on what you'd like. These are most likely considered Nemesis's best add-ons, and while he doesn't have any top-of-the-mountain fantastic add-ons like Blight, Plague, etc., Marvin's Blood is the general boost that you want to get to Tier 3 as soon as possible. And Shattered Stars Badge is incredible for someone looking to get usage out of zombies, be it information or general harassment of survivors. A zombie buffed by the Shattered Stars badge cannot be ignored or dealt with as easily, and it requires a survivor being chased by one to lose a zombie or waste a pallet or some flashlight battery to get rid of it. Serotonin Injector is one of Nemesis's few add-ons that never runs out of uses, and unless the survivor team is actively communicating where you are at all times, it does help you sneak up on survivors. Just not to the point where you're going to get a grab off a generator because he does have loud footsteps.
but it's the difference between a survivor knowing you're there from 32 meters away and 8 meters. The perks you're going to want to be running for this build are Corrupt Intervention, Bamboozle, Scourge Hook Pain Resonance, and then No Way Out or No One Escapes Death. This build has everything you might need, with Corrupt Intervention allowing you to get your early tier ups, foregoing getting an actual down to spread out contaminations and injuries, Bamboozle to make strong survivor tiles much weaker, for example, forcing a survivor to leave Shack early, drop the pallet early, or get hit for free at it. Pain Res is just good game slowdown, and No Way Out or No Ed is an endgame safety net. It's a very well-rounded build. Now, for my Horserer build of choice. Serotonin Injector and T-Virus Sample, these are by far my favorite add-ons. They combo incredibly well. You get two contamination points from whipping a zombie, up from one, literally double, and it makes you undetectable. The value is amazing, I love it a lot. I also don't personally enjoy zombie add-ons as much, but that's fine, you know, there's plenty of Nemesis playstyles, it's not my thing, it might be yours. Now, the perks I run are Lethal Pursuer, Grim Embrace, Pain Resonance, and Scourge Hook Floods of Rage. I love this build. It's currently my favorite in the entire game, as it fits my playstyle and allows me to play more of the type of Dead by Daylight that I enjoy playing, the chases. Lethal lets me start the game off quickly. Grim Embrace and Pain Resonance extend the game with minimal effort on my part. For example, I don't have to go look for a generator to kick with pop. And Floods of Rage makes Pain Res even better, because it lets me find my next chase relatively quickly. As well as survivors that think they're being sneaky. It's overall a lot of fun. I would recommend this one a lot. Now, for perks that synergize with Nemesis specifically more than other killers. Hex Ruin. This one is pretty self-explanatory, as zombies can push survivors off of generators and start them regressing automatically with zero input from you, the Nemesis. It's nice. Surveillance also combos well with the previous Hex Ruin and buffs zombie hearing by an incredible amount. I know I've been harping on this the entire guide, really, but I seriously cannot sell this perk up enough. It more than doubles the hearing range of a zombie to survivors repairing generators. 14 meters is a long way when it's through walls. This even counts through floors on multi-layer maps. So say you're on Midwitch or something and a zombie is below a survivor doing a generator, the zombie will hear it and go all the way up the stairs to where they are. It might take them a bit, but they're on the way. Discordance. The zombies will head towards the co-op gen from borderline across the map until they get into chase with a survivor or reach the generator and become idle again. It is a fantastic harassment tool that Nemesis uses incredibly well. It's a much better beginner perk when survivors duo up on generators more, I will admit, but it is very nice. Hex, face the darkness. Every time you make a survivor scream with this perk, zombies will approach the screaming survivors. Of course, whichever survivor is closer to the zombie at hand when they scream. And it is a good tool to keep your zombies with a head in the game instead of meandering off into a corner. And it is, unless you get very unlucky, a hard hex to cleanse. Corrupt Intervention. While every setup killer can appreciate Corrupt Intervention, Nemesis is like, setup killers. Also a very big fan of getting a more lax early game. Tearing up early is incredible for him, and games where I hit tier 3 before the Corrupt Intervention is timed out are incredibly difficult for survivors to come back from. And of course, any of the aforementioned perks in the perks section earlier will work and cause loud notifications and send your zombies that way, but these five are at the top for Nemesis using them better. They're all very nice, but these are the ones. What tier of killer is Nemesis? I would love for him to be better, mostly via an add-on pass, slightly smarter zombie AI, mainly, but with the RNG from zombies and his whole being a three health state killer thing, Nemesis is currently a high C or a very low B tier killer once you master his techniques. The inconsistency in his power budget from zombies is one of the main hindrances to him. Zombies can carry you one game and completely lose you a game the next game. This video here by Otsdarva explains a lot of my major gripes with zombies and does a good job talking about his inconsistencies as a whole. What is your favorite spot to hit a whip on? Over the Welcome Leon desk on RPD. It is on both versions of the map, and most survivors do not respect you pulling out the tentacle if you're on the opposite side of the desk, because the average nemesis doesn't go for hits like that. You hit them the first time, and then they begin panicking. It's just really fun to see. Can Nemesis swim? Bitch can't even swim. Ugh. 
And that is my full Nemesis guide. I'm Orser. Thank you for watching. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. If you have anything you disagree with on, I would love to hear your comments on it. Feel free to leave those below. I stream Nemesis three days a week on Tuesday to Thursday at 6 p.m. PST. And I have my Swift Nights on Friday at 6 p.m. PST. So if you'd like to come by and watch me play Nemesis, here's where to do that. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you have a good time playing and learning Nemesis as I have for so long. And, you know, fingers crossed that we're going to get an add-on rework someday. But until then, this is what we've got and this is how to use it. I hope you have a lovely day. Bye-bye.